Are you confused about what vaccines to give your dog or your cat? If you were to give your pet the advised core, non-core vaccines, that would be eight or nine different vaccines. And some of those, they're given yearly. In this edition of Veterinary Secrets, I'm gonna show you what vaccines I suggest giving, what to not give. Are you looking to learn more about natural pet health and wellness? You've come to the right place. Click the link to subscribe to Veterinary Secrets. The Canine Vaccine Task Force of AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association, they recommend five core vaccines for all puppies and dogs. A core vaccine is a vaccine they suggest is given to everybody. Some cases the frequency varies, maybe yearly, maybe every three years. For all puppies and adult dogs, they're suggesting parvo, distemper, parrot influenza, adenovirus, and the rabies vaccine. These are the core vaccines they're saying every puppy, every adult dog should get. Then there's four other non-core vaccines based on your veterinarian's discretion. Bordetella or the kennel cough vaccine, canine influenza vaccine. Then we have leptospirosis vaccine and its associated side effects along with the Lyme disease vaccine. You give these all to your dog, you could be giving nine different vaccines. What about vaccines for cats? The AAFP, the American Association of Feline Practitioners, they're recommending five core vaccines, meaning every kitten, young adult cat should be getting these. These include feline viral rhinotracheitis, feline Khaleesi virus, feline panluke or feline distemper, the rabies vaccine, along with feline leukemia and kittens and one-year-old adult cats. We don't want the cats to be left out, so there's also an array of different non-core vaccines. These include vaccines for chlamydia, vaccines for feline bordetella, feline leukemia virus in cats older than one year, then FIP or feline infectious peritonitis. You could be giving your young adult cat your kitten eight or nine different vaccines. The point of any vaccine is to keep your dog or cat healthy, but you need to be balancing the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of side effects. And clearly vaccines, they do have side effects. And not all the vaccines are equally effective. For instance, when you're trying to vaccinate against a bacteria, i.e. leptospirosis, i.e. the bacteria causing Lyme disease, Borrelia, they're not near as effective as vaccines for viruses. And in those cases, those vaccines typically need to be given yearly and often they have a higher incidence of side effects. And if you look at the AHA recommendations talking about canine vaccines, they claim that you should not be adjusting vaccine volume. They say you should be giving the same amount of vaccine to your teeny little chihuahua as you should be to a Great Dane. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't. AFP for cats, they say the same thing. Your teeny little kitten who's like a fraction of a pound, give him the same volume of vaccine as you do your 26 pound Maine Coon. And what I have a hard time getting my head around is during the whole COVID brouhaha, vaccine volumes were being adjusted. And what they're finding when people were given half doses, especially when they're looking at follow-up vaccines, guess what? Decreased incidence of side effects, pretty good immune response. So there's an example in people where they're modifying vaccine volume, yet for whatever reason we say you can't modify vaccine volume for your teeny chihuahua and your big Great Dane. Hmm. Does that make any sense at all? I wanted to address vaccine frequency in terms of how often the vaccines need to be given. So let's just look at the rabies vaccine. Yes, rabies is a serious neurologic disease and vaccines, they can be effective always against rabies virus. If your dog happens to be bit by a rabid skunk, if your cat is bit by a rabid animal, yes, the vaccine is very beneficial. And there's no real treatment for rabies. Your dog, your cat starts showing signs of rabies, fortunately they're gonna die. But we know the rabies vaccine seems to have a higher and above average incidence of side effects. So many links to autoimmune diseases, especially in our dogs and our cats, given the rabies vaccine. So how frequently do you need to give it? What they're doing is things called duration of immunity studies. This has been explored by many, many groups, one called the Rabies Challenge Fund, and they were looking at specific durations of immunity in terms of after giving the rabies vaccine, how long after post-vaccine was their protective immune response. They were finding minimum three years, more likely closer to five years, in some cases potentially even 10 years of immunity post the rabies vaccine, especially when it's given as an adult at one year of age. 
My point here being is that many of the vaccines, they're lasting much longer, yet there aren't real many good duration of immunity studies. So they're still sticking to these advised regimens. It means that we're seeing some dogs getting rabies vaccines every year. And I know with myself in veterinary school, we all needed to be vaccinated for rabies. We're working on animals, may come into the veterinary clinic with rabies. So yes, we had rabies vaccine, but I had immune levels taken 10 years post rabies vaccine. I still had protected level of immunity. But unfortunately, many areas sort of mandated by state law as to the frequency of how often rabies vaccine needs to be given. But ultimately, you make the choice, like what vaccines you're giving your dog or cat. You're not ultimately letting the veterinarian decide. Let's just consider distemper virus, parvovirus, two of the core vaccines, which really are important for our dogs. In all likelihood, if you were to give your adult dog at one year of age a distemper parvovirus vaccine, they may have more than enough adequate levels of immunity for the remainder of their life. Meaning they may not need, you know, three year boosters for distemper parvo. Yet yeah, for most dogs, that's what they're getting. Likewise for cats getting FBRCP, that's feline viral rhinotracheitis, the herpes virus, feline Khaleesi virus, along with feline panluc. In all likelihood, an FBRCP booster at one year may give your cat 10 years of immunity. Yet, why are so many cats coming in every three years getting these boosters again and again and again? Then, then we have the vaccines with questionable efficacy in terms of, are they even really helping? They seem to have a higher incidence of side effects. Lyme disease vaccine for dogs, for instance, hmm, just how effective is it? Maybe 60% protective in some cases, and it needs to be given yearly. And the Lyme disease vaccine, it has a high incidence of side effects. Or the leptospirosis vaccine for dogs, Obviously, you don't want your dog to be getting lepto, but just how effective is this vaccine? What about all the side effects? Leptospirosis is a bacteria that lives in standing water, typically transmitted by wild animals. But there are many, many, many different serovars or subtypes of leptospirosis bacteria. The vaccine itself is not covering all those serovars. And most the Lyme disease vaccine, because you're vaccinating for a bacteria, the lepto vaccine, because you're vaccinated against a bacteria, they both need to be given yearly just to be even somewhat effective. More vaccines, more frequent vaccines, higher chance of side effects. Then for cats, the feline leukemia vaccine. It's a killed virus vaccine, not near as effective. Generally needs to be given yearly if you're going to be giving it. And once again, a much higher incidence of side effects. One of the concerns with their cats is VHS or vaccine associated sarcoma. That's the vaccine causing cancer in your cat. And the leukemia virus vaccine is directly linked to that. Then we have all these autoantibodies that are produced from the vaccines. We know there's a clear correlation between our cats getting these repeated vaccines, autoantibodies, and our cats developing CKD or chronic kidney disease. So knowing all that stuff, Dr. Jones, what do you suggest? If I were to have a puppy and becomes an adult dog, this is the vaccine regimen I suggest. Three core vaccines, distemper virus, parvovirus, typically they're combined in one injection, along with the rabies vaccine. For the puppies, I would give distemper virus, parvovirus at eight weeks, a follow-up booster at 12 weeks. The rabies virus vaccine, if required, I would not give it to my puppy until six months of age. One year after the 12 week booster of distemper parvo, I'd follow up with one more distemper parvo vaccine. And the year after the rabies vaccine, I'd follow up with one more rabies vaccine booster. And that would only be if the rabies vaccine was required, meaning I'm living in an area where rabies exists and there's a concern that my dog may get it. And after that, I would be giving no further of these core vaccines. I wouldn't be giving distemper parvo again, if my dog was going to get it, much more likely to get it within that first year of age. Now she's made it to a year of age. The rabies vaccine, in all likelihood, there's going to be great protective immunity from that point forward. The only non-core vaccine I'd consider would be the Bordetella vaccine or the kennel cough vaccine. And I will be giving that if, for instance, Tula had to go into a kennel, she's exposed a whole bunch of other dogs in a small space. And I would make sure I'm giving it intranasally where you're dropping it into your dog's nose. You're not giving it via an injection. That seems to be a lot safer. Vaccines I would not give. Parainfluenza, adenovirus, influenza, leptospirosis vaccine, or the Lyme disease vaccine. I've had Tula for a little over six years. You want to know how many vaccines she's had in those six years? She's had zero vaccines. 
in my opinion, she was well vaccinated as a puppy, as a young adult. She's going to have great, more than adequate levels to protect herself against distemper virus, protect herself against parvovirus, the two most important viruses to vaccinate for, along with protection against the rabies virus. Hmm. She hasn't needed any further vaccines. She's 12 and a half. She's doing great. Hmm. I think there's something to that. And if I were to have a little kitten who became an adult cat, what vaccines would I suggest? The core vaccines, in my opinion, are the FVRCP vaccine. So that's feline viral rhinotracheitis, feline Khaleesi virus, along with feline panleukopenia. Typically, those three viruses are all combined in one vaccine injection. I would be given the FARCP vaccine at eight weeks, a follow-up booster at 12 weeks. Then the rabies virus vaccine, I'd wait until my kitten was six months of age and then give that rabies virus vaccine. At one year of age, I do the FARCP vaccine booster. Then one year after the rabies virus vaccine, I do one more booster. And that will be it for my cat. I would not give feline leukemia virus vaccine, chlamydia vaccine, feline mortatella vaccine, or feline infectious peritonitis, the FIP vaccine. I would not be using any of these other vaccines. And if I had a cat that was a strictly indoor cat, so we're having a cat that's just living in the house and never going outside, I would not be vaccinating my cat at all. Zero vaccines. You are not gonna bring a virus to your cat. It's gonna be another cat that exposed your cat. So you've got a 100% indoor cat, in my opinion, they don't need to be vaccinated. And how does it make any sense that a teeny little Siamese kitten that weighs all of like one and a half or two pounds is gonna get that same volume of the rabies vaccine as this a humongous Great Dane. That makes no sense. Yet that is what's happening in veterinary medicine. And obviously there can be exceptions to this. For instance, the area where I live, there was a leptospirosis outbreak last year. So for some dogs, say you happen to have a dog that seems to drink out of every single puddle going around, then that dog is much higher risk of getting lepto. So then you're trying to balance out what is the risk of the vaccine, especially when you're having a year during an outbreak. Okay, well, maybe then that makes more sense. You're going to then vaccinate your dog for lepto. There's a really high chance they're going to expose to the bacteria. But for most cases and for most dogs, and that would be my general opinion, I don't think it makes sense. So for most of the time, many of those other non-core vaccines, the ones we've discussed, they're just not needed. And the risk of the vaccine, it way outweighs any benefit. But in what world does it make any sense that you should be giving your little puppy, your little kitten, eight or nine different vaccines? Like that is crazy. Obviously the viruses are often combined in one injection just to make it more palatable. No, you're not giving them nine different individual needles, but still it's a good representative. You're gonna vaccinate for all those different things. Hmm. And then we kind of wonder why we see so many dogs with allergies, chronic ear infections, so many cats with chronic kidney disease. Hmm, wonder if this plays a role. Thank you so much for watching this edition of Enter Secrets of what vaccines to give, what vaccines to not give. Click up there to subscribe, hit the bell to sign up for notifications, and when you click that link directly in the box below, I can send you a copy of my free book.